Stiloperidone is safe and efficacious in patients with bipolar disorder. Or put another way, can we expect the same benefit in side effect profile? For example, lower risk of extraparamental side effects than has been shown in patients with schizophrenia, for which it has an FDA indication. Hi, Paul Zarkowski here with the Psychopharmacology Institute. Luckily, the manufacturer of Iloperidont funded a phase 3 randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study in adults with bipolar mania to answer this question. Subjects were enrolled at 27 sites in the United States, Bulgaria, and Poland between April 2021 and September 2022. Inclusion criteria were a young mania rating scale greater than 19 and at least one prior manic episode. Subjects were excluded if they met criteria for rapid cycling or if any other DSM-5 diagnosis besides bipolar disorder became the primary focus of clinical attention in the past six months. Subjects with dependence on substances in the previous six months were also excluded. Both these exclusions remove possible confounds. They also yield a study population that is different from the population I see at my community mental health center in which many, if not most, patients with bipolar disorder have comorbid conditions. Another exclusion was for subjects with poor response to at least two trials of antipsychotic medication in the past two years. This seems reasonable from a clinical standpoint, in which we would likely avoid a class of medication with a previous poor response. But, by excluding patients with a poor response to antipsychotic medication, it biases the sample towards response to antipsychotic medication. Of the 566 subjects that were screened, 417 were randomized, and 414 subjects received at least one dose of active medication or placebo. 208 received placebo, and 206 received eloperidol, up to 24 milligrams a day, given twice daily. This study implemented a modified intent-to-treat methodology, including subjects that received at least one dose of either eloperidone or placebo and received at least one post-baseline efficacy assessment. The authors found a statistically significant difference in young mania rating scale after two weeks and at the endpoint, which was four weeks, with a decline of 14 for eloperidone and 10 for placebo. They saw the most robust improvement in scales for elevated mood and speech, with a less robust response in the scales for appearance and thought content. The most frequently observed adverse event with eloperidone was tachycardia at 17.5%, compared to 5.3% on placebo. The next most frequent adverse effect was dizziness, consistent with alpha-1 blockade and decreased orthostatic response. The authors suggest that this same alpha-1 antagonism is also responsible for the low rates of akathisia and EPS in eloperidone. Although 4.4% of those on eloperidone reported akathisia compared to none on placebo, the authors note that there was no statistically significant difference in proportions of patients with worsening from baseline in the Barnes Akathisia Rating Scale. Mild treatment emergent EPS was reported in two subjects receiving eloperidone and none receiving placebo, although the authors add there was no significant difference in change from baseline in the Simpson-Angus Scale or the Abnormal Involuntary Movement Scale. Subjects receiving eloperidone gained 4.6 kilograms over the month compared to 1.63 kilograms on placebo. For those of us that think in terms of pounds, specifically Americans, that is 10 pounds of weight gain in a month for subjects treated with eloperidone. 7.3% of subjects on eloperidone had a mild to moderate increase in alanine aminotransferase versus 0.5% on placebo. And finally, the mean corrected QT interval increased 8.3 milliseconds in subjects taking eloperidone and decreased 1 millisecond for those in the placebo arm. As expected, 
Iloperidone speeds the resolution of manic symptoms. The incremental improvement in manic symptoms needs to be balanced against the side effect profile. In this case, significant weight gain, but with a favorable improvement in risk of akathisia and EPS. These factors should be included in the risk-benefit equation, which varies for each patient.